ACB are obviously big players in terms of, of sponsorships. You hear the sport of athletics um, on many levels around the world crying out for, we have the talent, we have this, we have that, we need to secure long-term sponsorships. Tell me what SAB looks for when they are deciding we are going to write a check to those people. Thank you very much and good morning to, to everyone. I think it's, I will take you back to, to, to uh, Spencer's presentation. Mm -hmm. There was a, a, a <coughs> the sweet, spots that, uh, sweet spot that he spoke about and uh, the second um, item would be the return on objective. Return on objective, okay. Exactly. So let me, let me start with the three circles um, first. So now those before you give, you want to know what you're getting back. Ultimately, is that uh, <laughs> it's, it's about... It's okay. It's, that, it's, again, it's, we, it's, want it's, to, we want to be honest. Ultimately, is that uh, as, as, as the fraternity, you yes. are selling something. So what are you selling? Because if you don't understand what that is, mm -hmm. you will never be able to convince me that actually what I'm looking for that I do not know you have in abundance. Yes. So, um, so in, it, within that frame, it was the brand, the property, um, and the consumer. The consumer becomes the most important mm. in terms of uh, actually understand that we're all in business um, to, 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 to make money in one way or the other with the products or the services that we sell. So you need to have clarity in terms of what is it that, 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 that I do um, and what is it that I'm trying to sell. The second part of it, um, around the, the, the return on objectives is that uh, whilst you are athletics um, selling the same product to everyone, actually we, myself and, and Spence and, the, and our companies have different objectives. So whilst his interest is mainly on the field, mm -hmm. my interest is never on the green grass, the track or the field, it's actually in the stands. Really? So at the end of the day, when you, when, when you have that property, you need to understand in terms of uh, what assets you have and who you're going to sell those assets to by understanding in terms of what people are looking for. And um, picking up a phone and, and, and calling to actually understand because the brands change over time. And I think it's, 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 in, it's, it's our job and it's in our best interest to actually understand uh, um, what, what, what the at athletics is looking for, but also in, the be in their best interest to actually know what opportunities are we looking for to communicate with our consumers? I would think that Spencer would be interested in the people in the stands too, because those are the people that are going to buy the shoes and the gear and the, and the hats and all that kind of stuff as well. But Spencer, um, it used to be that it was the Samsung Diamond League. <laughs> and I remember a couple of years ago, Samsung departed. And everybody sort of said, oh, don't worry. We'll find another sponsor really soon. Guess what? The Diamond League still has no sponsor. I want your opinion as to why a sport that, as we've said earlier this morning, is the cornerstone of the Olympic Games, right? Everybody is born, we crawl, we, we crawl, and then we walk, and then we run, and we find somebody to run against. How is it that the sport of track and field, for their premier series does not have a sponsor? I think it's an interesting question. That the, the simplistic answer is because the sport is fragmented with people of different interests. So what I'm trying to get to is each of those 14 diamond leagues has their own interest locally. Yes. So Brussels um, has a particular set of sponsors. New York has a particular set of sponsors, mm -hmm. as do Stockholm, Oslo, etc. And none of those sponsors, for the most part, um, manage to fit. They're all conflicting sponsors. Correct. So to get an overarching sponsor is really difficult. Because you can't have the Adidas Diamond League, because Prefontaine is sponsored by Nike. By Nike, yes. And, and as is the Shanghai Diamond League. So you can't get, it's very difficult to get that overarching sponsor. And one of the, the sponsors that was able to do that was Samsung. Oh, yes. Because electronic sponsors weren't that common for most of those individual Diamond Leagues. It's the same with the World Major Marathon um, running. They've, for a long time, they haven't had a sponsor because of their individual sponsors. I know that BMW were this close to signing a global deal, but New York has a deal with Tata. So as a result, the global possibility for BMW fell by the wayside. They now have just uh, concluded a deal with a company called Abbott's, which is a pharmaceutical company based in, in Chicago. So they're fortunate enough where none of the other events had a conflicting sponsor, so they could get that. So I think the answer to the question in a long-winded way is it's a little fragmented. Everybody has their own interest, um, their local interest, where they make sure they put on a meet and they have their own set of sponsors. 
and, and maybe we need to go back a step and change that thinking where, where maybe we need to get more control over those meets from an IWF perspective. Yeah. Um, and as you know, the Diamond League has their own board and they're, they're quite a powerful organization. And as a result, they go off and do their own things. Um, so we need to maybe change some of that thinking. So Errol, putting you on the spot, why has SAB never been affiliated with athletics? A lot of athletics people here, so we gotta, we got to <laughs> hold you to account. <laughs> Um, you guys have never been affiliated with athletics. What did we do you? Um, I think it's we, we, we've done a bit of work with, uh, with, uh, with the comrades. You um, have? Okay. A couple of times. But we've never been a headline sponsor. So that's marathons. Uh, we've never been a headline sponsor. And, 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 and I think, uh, whilst I, don't know, I wouldn't know the history, but mm -hmm. I think it's in, 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 the, in, the, in the recent past, in the last what, six, eight years that I've been, I've been there, yeah. um, um, there's never been attraction to get involved in, in athletics. And I think it's the controversy that surrounds um, athletics and also... Now we're getting somewhere. As I've said, in terms of uh, you know the basic bumps and seats is, is quite yes. important uh, for us because we um, most of our beverages are geared for the spectator, uh, not the athlete. So I think it's in terms of how we approach um, with marathons as as, as participation of type of sports is a lot is a lot more easier for us to get in, in, involved in because we can count the numbers. But in terms of track and field, um, is that we would, would like to actually see people going and watching these kind of sports, which will give us interest. So our first part of call will be um, getting involved in the, in, in with, the, with the local offices and, and, and the local clubs and federations, mm -hmm. and probably nationally um, to actually engage with, with, uh, with, uh, with the authorities that, that be in terms of um, lack of fragmentation, one, yeah. and also I'm sure that um, you know there's going to be a lot more stability um, with uh, with the athletics going forward. And the thing is that we create an environment where it brings people back um, to the sport. And if, if you bring people back, you bring eyes back, and you bring responses back. Right, uh, Spencer. I remember in um, after 1997, I was world champion '97, and then Commonwealth champion '98. I remember being in the meeting with Adidas and at the time, you know, when, when you have those, those sorts of medals, you can choose wherever you want it to go. And I had, my, I, had I, I thought, the ability to go anywhere. One of the reasons why I chose Adidas is because I felt like everybody's going to be over there at Nike <laughs> and I can have sort of my own house, so to speak. Um, so that's why I was choosing you guys. Um, this is not a question about me. I want to know what, um, what's involved in Adidas's process when they decide who they are going to go out and sign. Because every year, for example, at the NCAA championships, all the shoe companies show up and they have their pick of, okay, he's the national champion and this one looks like the next one. I want you to sort of give us an insight into what your process is you talked about your team and how you guys have signed the, the top five marathon guys ever that can't be happening by sheer luck what's the process that that takes place for you in selecting your athletes that you're going to sign i think it's, it's a number of factors obviously um, i think the, the the one key thing for us is an opportunity to, to view an individual in both a competitive and non-competitive environment often gives us an indication as to what that person's really like and what I mean by that is, you can see somebody on the track, um, and they can be a wonderful athlete or on the road, but off-field, um, and excuse my French, they could probably be a real arsehole. And that's what your brand doesn't want. Yes. From an individual perspective. But why does, why does your brand not want that? Because, I mean, let's, let's, let's keep it real. Most of the best athletes in the world have that a-hole trait, correct? <laughs> that's sort of what makes them great. Now, obviously, you have the, the, okay, the bolts of the world who, greatest sprinter to ever walk the face of the earth, genuinely a nice guy. That, that guy that you see on camera is not some put on. That is who he is when he wakes up in the morning, when he goes to sleep. Why the aversion to the a-holes? Well, just so we know, <laughs> I tried to sign Usain Bolt not once but twice. Okay, all right. Because he isn't an a-hole. Yes. Um, I think there are certain brands that attract themselves to people of that behavior. Um, if you look at some of the individuals that, that, that you may or may not be referring to indirectly. Mm -hmm. If you tend to look at the, the portfolio of Adidas athletes, we're fortunate enough that when you look across our 
um, spectrum of athletes, whether it be football or rugby or cricket or track and field. Yeah. That, that we, we really don't target ourselves to those type of people because we don't have an affinity with them. We really want the people that are homegrown type people that are decent in the way they present themselves and decent in the way they, they behave. Now, in saying that, one never knows what you're getting 100%. Of course. And so there's a risk. Th there's always a risk attached, and we've touched on some of the, some of, um, <laughs> the drugs in track and field in particular. It's something that we obviously are quite possibly exposed to almost on a daily basis. So you see somebody at face value, you interact with their parents, you interact with them off, off field, and you get an impression of them and you decide to be associated with them. Lo and behold, three or four years later, somebody tests positive and it's that person. Now, my simple analogy with that is, I can sit here with, with everybody in this room and draw an opinion based on the factors that are, are, are visible, that I can see. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what you do when you go home, as right. you don't know what I do. So th there's no way of telling what athletes do for 24 hours of the day. So whilst you have the ability to make a judgment, it's not always a home run. But we just find that sometimes we're not looking for that person that is at the front um, and behaving in, a, in an unacceptable manner. Whilst a younger consumer may identify with that, we just feel that we rather identify ourselves with people that are winners and that are presentable. Um, and in that way, we've been successful in, in finding sort of a right blend of athletes for the brand. I think you raise a very good point. I was never on CNN more than when the Pistorius story broke. And um, yeah, I know, no. They only call me when it's, uh, when they only call me when it's bad news. So um, <laughs> I went on, on, on CNN and some of those other um, media, sh uh, uh, news, cable news shows. And the number one question is, but didn't you know this guy? You interviewed him. I said, I know him at work. I know him at work. I know you at work. I have no idea what happens when you, know, when, when you go home. It can, be, it can be something totally different, which of course everybody was sort of incredulous about. Um, Era, let's get back to um, this whole concept of vision. Com companies, uh, uh, Spencer talked a little bit about you know, the mission of Adidas. When, you're, when your company meets for sort of looking further afield meetings, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? Spencer talked about, you know, they're not yet the leading sportswear brand in the world, but that's where they want to be. What does your company talk about um, as it relates to sport when they talk about where you want to be further down the road? Okay, so I think is what, uh, what I'll do is that I'll touch on the South African context because mm -hmm. I think is uh, the SA in SAB is very important to us. Of course. Uh, we're, we're South African business and I think is uh, we want to be the model uh, 21st uh, century competitor. So it's, it's, a, it's a greatest mind shift because we, most people here will actually say, how oh, SAB has got almost 90% of the market, mm -hmm. but actually we still have to compete. You know, that's the, that's the focus because that's how we can grow, um, excuse me, our business. The mindset needs to, be, needs to be within competition. But the SA part of SAB is that we, we, we need to ensure that we look after uh, the communities that we work within. So we have, uh, um, you know, uh, CSR projects that we work, work with. Currently, the Rhino is a hot potato in, right. in, in, in the country. We have programs around that. Um, football talent is, uh, is, 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 an, is, is another problem. I mean, um, for a bigger sport in, in the country, I'm sure people will disagree here. Um, but I think is that uh, we haven't qualified um, since 2008 for huh. any competition. So, I mean, we've, we've been involved in, 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 in programs that work with the Football Association in identifying talent. So I think is what we want to see ourselves is uh, to, to be the model, 21st century competitor. Model means how you behave, how you get to compete and win must be fair and be a representative of South African character. Both of you are both sons of the soil, so I feel like you are more than qualified to answer this question. Why is it that with as many medals as this continent has, with as many stars as this continent has in the world of athletics. Why do we not see a Diamond League meeting here? I'll, Either I'll one of you jump in on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I can start by saying, 
Maybe we should have lofty ambitions of having a diamond league, but let's start off by having a, a world-class challenge meet first. Of course, Because yes. we don't even have one of those. Right, right. There was a time when we had a number of international stars, and I remember you even coming out here and running in that atop, where we actually yeah, had... Yeah, we don't, we don't bring that up. <laughs> we're not going to bring that up. Where we actually had meets, and we actually had international people coming out here on, on, on their summer training stints, actually competing. Um, so I think that, that we should start off by having the lofty ambition of maybe having a Diamond League because there is a need for a Diamond League yes, there is. in Africa. Um, we've got Diamond Leagues in the US and in Europe and in, in, in Asia and in the Middle East, but we don't have anything in Africa. And to your point, there's so many um, medalists that come from Africa that, that we haven't had a chance to actually see on African soil competing yeah. in a competition of that nature. So I think it, it's a lofty ambition, but I think that we, we, we're going to need somebody, Leroy Newton may be the one, where he needs to sit down and say, right, let's start off by getting a meet off the ground with the lofty ambition of, of having a diamond league here. There is no excuse as to why there isn't one. Yeah, I'll throw back the gauntlet at, uh, at the fraternity, <laughs> because I think is we've, we've, uh, we've hosted great events in South yes. Africa of the world standard. Including the World Cup. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But the vision um, and the drive and the goal starts with the association themselves. Um, to I'm, have the ambition to host great events. I'm, I'm just going to put it out there because, you know, occasionally there'll be a joke made about hosting the Olympics in the Caribbean. And I go, yeah, but you have to understand that the Olympics happens on time. <laughs> 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 and we're, we're all... We're all <laughs> whether or not, and I know, I know this is a room full of people who really know athletics. You realize that they will, when you see athletes out on the field or the track, and you see them standing there doing what I call the, uh, the sprinter two-step. You know what the sprinter two-step is? The sprinter two-step is where you see them doing this. One, two. They're actually waiting for the time at which that race is supposed to go off. Now, I don't know how things are here, but in the Caribbean, time is merely a suggestion. <laughs> but it kind of it segues me to my next point point, and that is uh, my next question, and that is, how do we sort of begin to eradicate some of the stereotypes about the third world? I have been privy to some very disturbing conversations in which literally I would listen to meet organizers talk about the fact that athlete A from this country, usually European or North American, that person has to be paid a certain amount because the people that handle them are not going to take any less. But this Caribbean athlete, or that African athlete, we pay them whatever. Because where they're from, it's a little different, and they'll take what we give them. How do we as a sport begin to eradicate some of those stereotypes, you think? Um, let me take this one first. Okay, go right ahead. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's going to be important to, to, to work and, and know what you're worth. Yes. Because once you know what you're worth and you're comfortable with it, you will demand what, you, what, what, what you're worth. Yes. And I think is that um, South Africa sits in a very interesting position because we've, we have a, an MD who comes from Colombia who runs SAB for the first time and runs South African running SAB. Mm -hmm. He could not understand... Um, his perception of coming to what he perceived as a, as a third world country where we have such expensive sponsorship fees. Hmm. He says, what, what's happening? But at the end of the day, is that uh, once you have a good product and you can deliver yes. a, against that, you will never be short of people that would, would be prepared to pay what, you, what, 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 what you're worth. I think case in point, if you look at the, the Premier Soccer League football in South Africa, they have sponsorship for everything, for every competition that they have. Why? Because they've worked hard to ensure that the they position, mm -hmm. they position their product and they can actually ensure that they deliver for their sponsors. I think I can proudly say that the two individuals in the room um, and Johan Blake mm -hmm. are of Caribbean and African, African Kenyan, yes. uh, and they are the highest paid individuals in our portfolio. Really? So I can proudly say that. I thought there was a secret. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's, there is a, a sense of reality. Um, unfortunately, 
that there are unscrupulous people involved in the sport as well. And I think that hurts probably Kenya more than any other country. Mm -hmm. Because they're interested in bringing the athletes to the fore and making as much money out of them as quickly as possible. Yes, absolutely. Which leads to those athletes being around for two or three years because they're running in every other race and you don't get an opportunity to build a brand around them. And that's the difference with, with Dennis and Wilson, for example. We can build a brand around them because they've been around for years and they win stuff. Um, it's no use to anybody if an athlete is around for three years and gone. And that's what's damaging Kenyan athletics. So there's so many athletes with a quick turnover, so people are getting away with paying them less money. I think that there needs to be education from all sides, from the management side, from Kenyan athletics, from, from the Kenyan athletes themselves, to understand their worth and not try and run at every race. It's a problem in South Africa as well. There are a number of athletes that will run a half marathon on a Saturday and a mm -hmm. marathon or a 10K on Sunday and something on Wednesday. So it's a process of education. And I know Ilan is doing a lot of work on that to try and get those gentlemen and ladies to understand by running less, you actually have a greater opportunity to recover better. And ultimately, when you run at these world major marathon events, you've got a better chance of winning. I never understood, I never understood that until very, very recently. Um, just a, a brief, a brief um, love ode to South Africa. Um, I own a Tesla which of course, we, we call him uh, Tony Stark, the guy who plays Iron Man. Um, obviously the guy who is the CEO of, of Tesla, Elon Musk, is a South African. I don't know what sort of esteem you guys hold him in here, but he's a demigod in the United States because where gas is very ridiculously expensive, um, he has created this fantastic, he's created this fantastic car. And you know, it occurred to me that when I bought the car, they told me, Mr. Bolden, yeah, we've Googled you so we know what your history is. In this car, if you go slower, you will go faster. Huh? I was like, what are you talking about? Now, mind you, I picked the car up in the northwest of the United States and I had to drive it down to, uh, to California to, uh, to, to ship it back home. I live in Florida. And I got in the car and I'm so excited about this new car and I've been a fan of this car company for so many years and a fan of what that man is doing in terms of he's putting people into space and he's just, he's revel he's, listen, I was never supposed to be a, an athlete. I am a geek who they discovered could run. So I am a lot more interested in tech stuff than I am in sports, sorry to say. So anyway, so this guy handed me the keys to this beautiful new car and he told me, by going slower, you can go faster. And I thought, this guy's stupid. I was in the business of speed for so many years. This guy's telling me, go f slower to go faster. So I'm driving this car like 80, 85 miles an hour. I got my first ticket within seven minutes of owning the car. A new world record. So you, yeah, you guys are not the only two world record holders <laughs> and Jackie in the, in the audience. I have a world record for having tickets. And then I realized what this guy was trying to say, and it's to your point. By driving the car at 85 miles an hour, guess what? I'm having to stop every two hours to charge it. <laughs> Slow down to 65, and the car will run for three and a half hours. So I understand what you, what you say when, when, when you talk about that. Um, I want to wrap up. Um, we have about three minutes left. I want to wrap up our discussion. Um, I know you guys don't get to hear me prognosticate very often, but... Quite frankly, I think that's why NBC hasn't gotten rid of me yet, because I don't have much of a filter for my mouth, and I grew up in the States listening to a lot of broadcasters say things that I thought were very pro-country. I am pro-athlete. So if I am watching a race and I believe that Allison Felix is going to win this race and it will not be close, that's what I'll say. However, if I'm watching a race and I say, Usain Bolt is going to win this race and nobody else will be within 10 feet of him. I say that too. That, all, that doesn't always go over very well if the second place person happens to be American. So one of the things that I have said recently and I realize it's getting some attention is I said that, listen, the continent of Africa and the country of South Africa, obviously, um, recently hosted a World Cup. I believe that very, very soon, when we go to Rio in 2016, I'll be the first South American country to host an Olympics ever, correct? I believe that very soon, 
it's going to be time for Africa's, you know, for Africa to host an Olympics. I want you to tell me if that's a view you share, and if so, why, or if not, why? Um, I think we lost that in 2004, I believe. Yes, to, 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 to Athens, Athens and, yeah. and we know how that worked out for them. <laughs> yeah. I bet, you they, I bet you they could go back, they'd trade and say, oh, please take this Olympics from us. Yeah, I, I think it's, ruin it's, their economy. It's, it's important in so, ma in so many levels. I think, it, I think it's uh, to, to actually showcase the capability of the African continent to know what they can do, to also change the narrative um, for, for the kids growing Absolutely. up, to actually look, look, look at, at themselves differently in terms of the potential that they could have in the global stage. And I think is that, that, that becomes important. And I think is, is that um, not only that because I'm South African, I want it here, um, <laughs> but I think it would be great to actually have a couple of countries who have the potential to host it and actually host different, different types of events within athletics so that actually it's no longer just the South, but the rest of the continent has the capability to actually rewrite um, how the world sees us and how the, um, ourselves as Africans sees our potential. Why is, why, why is Africa last in hosting the, the Olympics? Why everybody else and then Asia eight million times and then okay, South Africa gets one and Africa still, still yet to get one? I think it, it, it's probably twofold. One, I think that maybe there wasn't the sponsorship support, which mm -hmm. as we know is, is a major, major factor uh, in the Olympic bidding yes. process and staging uh, the Olympics. And I think that there was probably a, a feeling that, that there was no African country that, that could quite simply hosted, that they just didn't have the expertise. Right. And as Errol's pointed out, that was quite very successfully um, shown up with the successful hosting of the, the, of World, the Cup. World Cup football here, yes. where they showed that an African country can not only host it, they can actually host it pretty darn well. Yes. And I think that maybe that's changed the perception, that maybe people are looking at it now realizing, oh, okay, hold on, there, there, there are an African country, i.e. South Africa, and other countries that could quite possibly host the Olympics. Um, I think it's time. We've all, we all know the flag. There's a black ring on there. It's time that it comes to Africa. Boy, 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 boy.